Let's start this discussion. Um, just to, to summarize what we've learned and maybe give some time to, uh, for people to recover, um, <laughs> I would like to, to start with uh, the discussion. Um, we've heard about stereotypes, heuristics, biases, different type of biases, and maybe um, I would like to ask you to clarify um, if there are differences, what are the differences between stereotypes and uh, cognitive biases, uh, specifically in uh, the gender context. Um, are they different? How they relate to each other? And for instance, I have the impression that uh, stereotyping uh, results from a set of different cognitive biases, if you can maybe give some more details about this. And I think uh, this is important also because uh, the way uh, we differentiate stereotypes and cognitive biases, um, it also have, uh, it's not only semantics, it also means we can train or fight these two different aspects with different tools. So this is also what I have in mind for the next part of the discussion. And um, so I will let you, all of you, maybe you can start, Susan. Uh, and after that, we will take the questions from the uh, audience. And also Eliana, thank you very much, Eliana. She will uh, ask the questions from uh, the Zoom participants. Sounds great, thanks. Um, I can give you my answer, I, there might be disagreement in the round, but for social psychologists, generally stereotypes are defined as cognitive beliefs we have about certain groups of people. And um, in the case of gender stereotypes, as we talked about, these are often ideas that we think women are particularly nurturing, particular um, kind, um, or more so than men, less aggressive than men, but also less ambitious, less competent, less intellectually uh, uh, able or skilled. Um, it is not necessarily a bias, and that's where it gets interesting, because um, originally they were defined as beliefs that were exaggerated but had a kernel of truth. Nowadays people get out of this debate a little bit in the definition by saying they're just beliefs that are associated with a group that may or may not be true. And for a bias, I think, I would say, it implies that something is not true, that you're misperceiving something or misjudging something. So the big question then is, well, how do we know whether a stereotype is true or it's not true? Um, and when is it a bias or when is it just a correct assessment, simplified, but a correct assessment of a situation? Albert? I, I would kind of agree. For me, a stereotype is a heuristic, and in a certain context, this heuristic can become a bias. Like if I stereotype, I categorize, it's necessary. Like heuristics are a way for us to be efficient. If I have to be, to verify everything every time I have to move. And we use heuristics not just for our reasoning, but also for our body. Like if I walk, if my brain has to calculate the strength with which I have to raise my, my leg, how many centimeters I have to move it forward, and then we just do this approximately. And it works, and sometimes I'm gonna stumble and fall. It's, a, it's an acceptable price to pay. And categorizing is also the same thing. I'm going to categorize things into fruits, into seats, chairs, people, etc. In some, this is why I was saying that biases are contextual. In a certain context, these heuristics can become non-optimal or wrong, and then they become a bias and discrimination, etc., etc. Et and would you agree if I say, okay, uh, the sentence? Um, men are uh, natural leaders, women are emotional. I would say this is a stereotype. But in the other story, um, so someone uh, is uh, recruiting and there are two candidates, a man and a woman. And even though the woman has higher skills, higher uh, experience, uh, the recruiter chose uh, the man. And for me, this is a bias. Would you agree with this association? I would, I would say both are biases. Like thinking that men are natural born leaders and women are more emotional would be a bias because we're essentializing, if we think in theoretical models, we're saying that gender predicts, like we call this single cause fallacy, like the gender is the single most important predictor of leadership. But this is probably not true because it's much more complex, you have temperament, you have the way you were raised, what you worked for, the friends around you, the way you talk, uh, 
your eloquence, etc. All these things have to be put in the model towards leadership. And you're reducing this, you're oversimplifying. When you're oversimplifying and it's non-optimal anymore, your model doesn't work anymore, it's a bias. I would say both of them are biases, and none of them is a heuristic. And I think another thing to really consider is um, there are two levels here that we need to look at this. So one is the assumption, is the first statement you made on average true about this group? Yeah, do men, for whatever reason, maybe are better natural leaders? And then, even then, we would still have the question, if we show that, why would that be the case? Is that something biological? Is it socially uh, created? And so on. But even if you show that this is the case for the group level, when you judge an individual, you don't know how much can you now apply the difference in the group average and how big this average is. It's the same, like on average, men are taller than women, but it doesn't mean that every woman in the room is smaller than every man in the room. So that is the, there are two challenges. One is to first say, is there a group average? And then, does the group average apply to the individual? And I think that's what makes these discussions around uh, biases so difficult, because we often flip back and forth between these two levels, um, but they're both important to keep in mind. Exactly. Wim, do you want to share some thoughts? I think that's a really good summary. To me, like the bias starts at the point where you're actually going from the group general level to the individual level. So there's a question whether the group level is the generalization accurate, yes or no? Or an average man taller than women, yes or no? You might have your beliefs there, but it's at the point where you're going to make a decision about one individual. That's where bias might start hitting you and where it's actually can have really bad com uh, consequences. So. Like intervention-wise, I think it's at, at that point that we should actually act. Because even if like the group level stereotype is accurate, let's say that it is indeed the case that most men are taller than most women, if you're going to make a decision about one individual, let's say that for one reason or the other, you want to hire someone, the tallest person possible, then it might very well be a woman. So you should actually, what you should do in that case is just like measure them and see whether whoever is the tallest, and that's going to be the person that you're going to hire. So at the level of interventions, like doing something about biases, I think that's specifically where I think that we should especially act and be cautious. Thank you. Are there questions in the audience? Generally, while asking questions, please keep your masks on, because we're all sharing the same mic. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the very uh, interesting and nice talks. Uh, I have a, a question related to um, more about the acquisition of bias and the strength of their persistence. And uh, I thought the comparison uh, we made about um, addiction, uh, with addiction is very interesting, like a smoker who, who knows, and by definition the addiction is you know it's harmful, but still you cannot stop. So. Um, uh, one thing which is fascinating is how do we acquire bias and to what extent are they reversible and uh, it would be really interesting to know, for example, um, one, easy, one thing which e easily comes to mind is um, uh, social reward because people acquire bias within a social group and if everybody thinks the same, they are encouraged to think the same, to have the same bias, etc. So if we want to reverse bias, it would be really interesting to know what are the drives to acquire them. And it's not neutral, it's not just intellectual, because if you, it would be enough to know there is a bias to correct it in a way if it were very superficial. But it's deeply uh, um, imprinted in the brain somehow. So are there been, either in your work or in some other people's work, um, uh, attempts to address that and uh, to know how these um, bias are acquired and how reversible they might be. I think, like in general, that's what people trying like, like the bias training or like exposure, like exposing you to the actual to the correct stereotype, so to speak. And like you see that uh, not all Moroccans or Algerians are criminals, etc. The more experience you have there, that might help actually help you to correct that stereotype or that association that you made. Um, but coming back to what you said, I too, I believe that the fact that if you can show that people show some basic sensitive, sensitivity, that's a good thing. Because it's then easier actually to intervene if there's already this basic acknowledgement of maybe I'm doing something that's not actually what I should be doing. But not everyone would agree because there's this different view saying, well, 
It's actually worse if people already are picking up on the fact that what they're doing is not actually good and they're still doing it. That's actually making it worse. So I don't necessarily agree because I think it's like if you would think about, like, for example, uh, psychopaths, for example, we would all agree like if you do not realize that what you're doing is bad, that's worse than if you're already realizing that what you did was not optimal, that's going to give you an easier route to uh, intervention, to um, making things better, to actually help you boost your decision making and, and get to better decisions. So that's uh, my two cents on it. I don't know, what are you guys? I think generally, I mean, there are two mechanisms. One is um, that bias gets acquired, uh, acquired through your own experience, that you generalize negative experiences. And the other one is, of course, and that's a really big one, is cultural transmission. And we know um, that both um, result in uh, humans picking up gender stereotypes, for instance, very early on. There are nice studies that show that even two-year-olds, for instance, are surprised if a man puts on uh, lipstick or a woman puts on a tie. Yeah, they start to have expectations about what goes with certain gender uh, categories. And they're extremely sensitive to read how men and women get treated. And that's why I think these relational impressions that I refer to are so important to understand. There was a really nice study recently published by Max Weisbuch, where he um, studied six to ten year old kids and they watched uh, standard comics um, uh, on, on TV um, where the female character engaged in stereotype consistent or inconsistent behavior. And what they coded is how this character uh, was responded to by other characters in the, in the cartoon. And what was shown is that A, there's a bias if a, if a female character engages in stereotype inconsistent behavior, there are more negative emotional responses and other characters towards this. Um, and the, the children picked up on this and they were more likely to engage in stereotype consistent behavior afterwards because they had learned if I engage in stereotype inconsistent behavior, other people are showing emotional signs of disapproval. And they could also nicely show that this was related to how much people, or in this case kids, were able to track the emotional responses of others. So if you were not yet you know, mature enough to understand emotional expressions, you didn't have that effect. But if you were able to track emotional responses. And why I find that study and similar of that kind, and Max has several of these, so important is because it really highlights how subtle mechanisms can be through which we acquire um, uh, expectations about what is appropriate for certain groups of people just by observing our surroundings and that starts really really early. Um, does that mean we cannot have effective interventions because you said and it's often said it's ingrained in our brains. I would slightly disagree with that statement. I think we are uh, you know we are just very good at observing our environments and at extracting the norms and um, responding to that. So changing these norms is not easy but I think it is possible and then I think we are also uh, of course possible to adapt. So I don't think, uh, you know, whatever you learned when you were one, two or three years old will stick with you forever. Um, but of course it's what I think you might say, it's your prior. It's the prior based on which you operate. And, you know, overcoming these priors is, is not easy. Thank you. Uh, are there questions on Zoom? Yes. <laughs> uh, so I, I will start by one from Sophie Nicole. And she asks, um, well, she states that these bias are here to instinctively drive our social behavior. So uh, would it be possible to have adequate or comprehensive social behaviors toward, toward those other people without this bias? Who wants to? It's a very interesting question because today we're focusing about the negative aspect of biases. But biases can also be helpful. For example, if I have a selection bias or a confirmation bias with my daughter, this will allow me to treat her differently and preferentially compared to other people. So sometimes biases like being of bad faith with the people that are close to me can help also with social cohesion. So obviously there is a whole set, to, to go back to what you were saying, of this embodied cognition, that our cognition is also embodied in a social net, in, in a social circle, and this social circle is having feedback loops, constant feedback loops towards these priors that we're creating. It's also implicit learning. So the question becomes complicated about what are all these implicit learning that are going around. Just like was said, we are extremely good at picking up social signals because we form ourselves through social ties and social relationship as social animals. So there are all these parameters that we have to take into account. When are these implicit learning mechanisms that are going on helping with 
social, social cohesion, creating coherent groups, having positive reinforcement. We see this a lot because now we're, we're only talking about biases in the social cognition. But for example, when I'm seeing patients, if someone has uh, is jealous, it's also prediction errors about the, the something that is hurting them, just like the smoking example. And then it becomes much more complicated to untangle this whole uh, learning that is constantly going on and these feedbacks from society. And I agree that changing the norms becomes complicated. Of course, it's easy and usually it's generational. This is why we have these new generations always viewed negatively by the one that's older. But I would say like, it's a bit complicated to disentangle everything going around. I don't know if you have any other elements. Maybe we can take a question. Another question in the room? Um, so I really loved Wim's example just before when he said if you want to hire the tallest person uh, that you can find for a certain job. So does that mean uh, you need to write down the objective criteria before you're actually interviewing the people? So that should actually help. Can you confirm these kind of uh, approaches? I mean, there's a lot of evidence showing that's exactly what you should do when you're interviewing, going for like a structured interview where it's like clear, you have clear, predefined criteria, questions you're going to ask. Um, I think we all know, I mean, an unstructured interview, like it's like an invitation for bias to occur. So yeah, for sure, I'd agree. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> Uh, Eliana, another question? Yes, uh, I'll take one from Delphine Ball. Uh, and she said that the speakers have given examples of uh, tests that were done in Americans, mostly. And if, if you know that these studies have been replicated in France, because the bias are not necessarily the same. All these studies, I just show them, like give examples, American examples, but we're frequently running them in France and the exact same thing. So. French people are on average as biased as their American counterparts. So, unfortunately, yes, they do generalize. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe just to, to say some of the cognitive biases, I think with your verbal material, translate quite well across cultures. But I think some of the social biases indeed are very culturally sensitive. Um, and that's also part of the gender bias discussion. Yeah. So, for instance, if you go to um, not the best example right now, but if you go to Russia, for instance, there's a big stereotype that women are very good at math and they're very successful female mathematicians, which in uh, you know other Western countries or uh, Germany, uh, France, the UK, um, the idea is often that women are not good at math. So the content of these stereotypic beliefs that we have attached to certain categories can change quite drastically across cultures. And it's a very important question to ask whether these American findings easily translate to the European context indeed. And I think the, this also goes beyond cognitive biases. We see these cultural differences in, for example, attentional biases. When we do like eye tracking uh, uh, experiments on social cognition, for example, the way we explore faces, for example, in Europe is extremely different than the way we explore faces in Japan, for example. Yeah. So it's the whole information processing theory changes culturally also. I have the feeling that in the debate, sometimes we're um, kind of forgetting uh, self-fulfilling prophecies that might impact at each point uh, what we're talking about. Even with the, the example of like, I should hire the tallest. Well, why is this person the tallest? Like, is there a self-fulfilling prophecy here? Um, and I was wondering, like in those studies, do you have ways to take this into account or at least to yeah to control for that it's it's not easy i know but uh, in those debates i feel we should like focus on this as well <laughs> i was just referring to the fact that if there's like an objective criteria use the objective criteria but then the whole discussion becomes that you might argue well if i show the, the results showing like hey actually this woman is the tallest that people might go yeah, but maybe, you know, you know, we didn't really measure it like really accurately because we all know that guys are taller, right? Stuff like that. So you have that level too, even if there's an objective criteria that you can actually test, that you still need to interpret it. So even at that level, biases can still occur. So. Yeah, but what I meant is if guys are taller, why? Okay, that's not a good example on, on the size, but like uh, if I want the best person in math, uh, 
why are guys <laughs> the best person in math? Uh, like, should we stick to those criteria or should we, should we start to switch and, I don't know, it, it's like a social debate rather than a scientific question. <laughs> No, but I think it's a really important one to keep in mind what the problem here is. So one, for instance, is the idea with leadership. Yeah, is it the idea that you need to be ambitious and driven and uh, aggressive in order to be a good leader? Or is it about being empathic and, you know, being a good people person? And depending on which idea of leadership you prime, people think, oh, women are the better leaders or men are the better leaders. Um, so this is the question, well, how do we actually know what the criteria for the job is that we need? Yeah, so what makes a good leader? The second question is then, and that's also what you mentioned in that, um, so, how do we know, you know, if we objectively could show that women are more empathic than men, for instance, and this is a big question, do, we still don't know why is that. Is that because we live in the culture we currently are in with the social norms as they exist? So, is this a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, as you would refer it? Or is there some biological reason that underlies? And I think it's safe to say that for many people, when they hear about the gender difference, they jump to the conclusion that there is some biological component in it. And of course that is what a lot of the research is about, to trying to highlight that actually our mind can create these conclusions irrespective of whether there is a biological difference. At the same time though, we don't know often. It could be that there is a biological difference. Yeah? So we can, these, these, that's what makes these questions so difficult. We don't know if you had a completely uh, gender equal society, would some of these problems fall away or would they still replicate because it's just something about how people function. Um, but I do think in the afternoon we are getting talks that get to this point a little bit more. I also think this is the importance of theoretical models and what you're showing in your presentation that the data is in here yet so that we have comprehensive theoretical model about the way of everything like what is self-fulfilling prophecy what is due to social pressure what is due to conformity what is due to culture we don't know yet what factor weighs how much in the end result behavior that we're seeing for example in the drawing when you say it's a geometry task versus it's a drawing task is it just the view like the big malion effect because the teacher expects children that are women to be less good at math, so they put less effort? Is it learned helplessness because we have a self-fulfilling prophecy where we think we're not good enough? Is it the biological structure where boys are better at uh, spatial rotation in their mind versus uh, girls, etc.? We don't have this theoretical model yet, and which is the real challenge. How do we identify and weigh these different elements? Um, time is flying. We have just time for one quick question from Zoom. Please, yeah. Eliana. I will uh, pose a question from Basem Hassan. Uh, and he says, it will seem to me that the context in which the bias is being measured is critical. As a thought experiment, let's imagine a task designed by a little green creature to be particularly well performed by little green creature in a society that also contains large red creatures. Even if an objective selector were to unbiasedly choose the best creature to perform the task, they would tend to choose the little green creatures over the large red creatures. So how does one account for the initial bias in a context? Yeah, I mean, this is what we were talking about now. It's the whole yeah. prior thing. Like, when, when they did the test for, there's the example of the drawing and geometry, there's another similar experiment that was done in the 60s where they gave a math ex exercise for little, little boys and girls and they showed that boys succeeded better and were like, we shouldn't be politically correct, the data is in, boys are better, and then they replicated it maybe 20 years later when we learned about learned helplessness and all these effects and they told, told the little children that this was math for women and then the, the performance difference changed. So obviously the design of the task is also encased in the cultural and the priors of society. And how do we go about uh, correcting those is the whole, it's like the holy grail of the whole field. Like how do we make sure that we're removing and then trying to identify, is it in the exercise, is it in the experimenter, is it in the experimentee, is it in the culture, so if we replicate in a different country, and then try to understand what are the different factors that are at play that are creating these priors.
I just think, um, sorry, I talk a lot, but I just want to think the important thing is to highlight that this often leads to contradictory discussions in this area. So with the leadership example I gave is you could have the argument that, of course, many leadership positions are still filled by white males who have ideas that it's about, um, you know, uh, being ambitious or being aggressive and working independently and competitively. And then, of course, one question as well, Maybe that is the wrong criteria that was set in the first place, because that might uh, advantage men over and over again. Um, but uh, then you're not asking, you're not disagreeing with the stereotype. You're just saying we, we are choosing the long, wrong criteria here. But we agree generally that men are more aggressive and ambitious than women. We just think that the, the uh, character characteristics that women bring to the table, like empathic listening or whatever, should also be considered or should maybe become criteria to select for. And that, of course, in some contexts is indeed the right question to ask. Are we measuring something or are we expecting for certain roles criteria that are made for the little green men and they shouldn't be made for the little green men? Nevertheless, that doesn't ask the question, well, are the little green men and the large red person really different? Or do we just perceive them as different? And if they're different, where do these differences come from? And I think because both are valid questions in the real world, they often contradict each other in solving or finding good interventions because it's a very different intervention to say okay we accept that we are different we just need to make the selection criteria more general to give different groups the same chance or do we actually think no we are all the same we just live in environments we don't have a chance to show that so the criteria are not the problem it's whether we can excel at these criteria thank you well, if things were simple, uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they are quite nicely summarized in, uh, in this picture. Um, I thank you very much, all of you, for uh, being with us today and for this discussion. Thank you uh, to all the, the people here for their questions. Um, and good news is coffee time. And please be back uh, in 20 minutes. Thank you so much, Amanda.